Welcome back, guys. So the uh, topic today is actually a continuation of this uh, stability of the Hartree Fock and Thales theorem. So Thales theorem sounds like something. What what has that to do with Hartree Fock and many body physics? It actually contains uh, many of these small dots, uh, which uh, can give us a kind of deeper intuition about Hartree Fock theory and what Hartree Fock theory is actually doing. So there are many things which we discussed yesterday, uh, which may take some time to digest. So I will revisit some of the basic equations, but everything actually floats around the uh, usage of uh, Thaulis theorem. And Thaulis theorem says that you can, in second quantization, you can express a Slater determinant in terms of a Slater determinant, which contains one particle, one whole excitation. Now, sometimes when you make a change of a way to represent a physical system, what can happen is that that kind of change, like us going from the standard quantization, where we set up the equations in coordinate space, and we make a transformation to a so-called Fox space or number representation, or just second quantization, that can actually give us a deeper physical understanding of what is going on in Hartree Fock theory. So, my hope now is that by uh, bringing up Thaulis theorem, that you see the dots in a clearer way. Now, the reason why I bring this up is the following if we go back to the uh, material we had in the very beginning of the semester, so if we look at the a representation of a Slater determinant. So if we just scroll down the, the slides from the very, very first week, there were lots of mathematical technicalities, which we use now and then. And one of these technicalities dealt with the transformation from one basis to the other one. And this is essentially what we are doing in Hartree Fock theory. We have a unitary transformation, which hopefully gives us a better estimate of the energy. Now, in principle, we are just operating on one Slater determinant, which is the answers for the ground state. So when we do this uh, operation here with a unitary transformation of a single particle basis, what we end up with is actually a transformed Slater determinant in terms of these coefficients, which we can write out as the determinant of this matrix of coefficient C times the all determinants. So essentially in Hartree Fock theory, the way we have expressed it, uh, not by varying the single particle wave functions, but varying the coefficients. So this is equally allowed. I mean, it's just one recipe to implement the variational principle and variational calculus. However, when you look at this equation here, it's not so easy to extract a simple physical interpretation. So you could say now that here, I'm summing over all possible single particle states, but what does it mean? The thing which is nice when you move to second quantization is that this picture which you see here, which is essentially what Hartree Fock is doing, so you're optimizing these parameters so that you get a better estimate for the ground state energy. In second quantization, we can actually give a physical interpretation to these parameters, which is more simple. And that physical interpretation is that this combines the original basis states we had with one particle, one whole excitations. And that this Slater determinant, actually the way it stands here in the standard uh, configuration uh, or coordinate space picture of first quantization may not give you that kind of physics insights immediately. So Thaulis theorem expresses this quantity here in a more compact way in terms of a linear combination of one particle, one whole excitations, plus the answers you had for the state. So that's why I want to spend some time on Thaulis theorem. And then with Thaulis theorem, we can easily implement the Hartree Fock conditions when you do variational calculus. Okay? So, this is a kind of overarching motivation with Thaulis theorem. So, it hopefully gives us 
a uh, nicer physical interpretation in terms of particle hole excitations. So one of the advantages of second quantization is that you can think of a physical system and the kind of correlations you bring in in terms of this particle hole excitation picture. So it's just a way to read and interpret a quantum mechanical system. And it gives you a kind of jargon, which is very powerful. And you can express all the equations in, obviously, second quantization, which are equivalent to those in first quantizations. But sometimes in first quantization, it's not that easy to see what does this actually mean. So this is a kind of uh, things uh, we are going to balance along in order to uh, uh, try to get a kind of deeper understanding about what is going on. So I wanted just to quickly refresh the things we did yesterday and just restate uh, some of the stability equations. So if we just scroll down uh, the slides uh, and the material which we covered yesterday. So I'm going to skip here and then I'm going back to Fowler's theorem because we used that one when we wanted to prove that uh, there is a Slater determinant here, which uh, given by this C, so there's a compact notation we use for the Slater determinant, where this state here is the one which gives us the best estimate for the ground state. When we perform this variational calculus, where we vary the coefficients of the single particle states. So just keep in mind, we are varying the coefficients of the single particle states. When we did FCI, we varied the coefficients of the money body state. So that's different. So the uh, uh, we ended up with uh, uh, an expression here. And this is the one we are going to prove today that this is actually what we can do with the uh, Hartree-Fock theory and uh, a general Slater determinant, which can be expressed like this. So this is the equivalent of what you had in first quantization, which I showed you previously. And we then use this Slater determinant here to uh, perform the expansions. We calculated the overlaps. Uh, we assume that the uh, overlap is non-zero between this C prime and C. And then we calculated all these different expectation values and at the end here, we could rephrase everything in terms of a, a matrix a eigenvalue problem. And by doing that, we ended up with this specific matrix. And then we could claim that in order for this to be larger than zero, this quantity here, or equal to zero, which means that the ground state we have found with the Hartree-Fock calculation is the optimal ground state, or it's a better one than the one we started with. Uh, this means that uh, this matrix has to be semi-positive definite, which means that all eigenvalues have to be larger or equal to zero. And that puts a simple but not sufficient condition uh, on the diagonal matrix elements, which have to be larger than zero. So you can actually look up the diagonal matrix elements in case you diagonalize this matrix, or you just take away these values B, and you only look at the diagonal ones. So then a kind of signal that actually when you uh, want to figure out whether a matrix is uh, positive definite or semi-positive definite, one way to do that is to, which is unnecessary but still not sufficient, is to sum up all the diagonal elements and that sum should be larger or equal to the one from the non-diagonal ones. That mm -hmm. is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. So it gives you a kind of quick and dirty way of estimating. Now, the uh, thing which I want to do now is actually go back to Fowler's theorem. So I'm just going to bring up the whiteboard and uh, we are going to go through these uh, gritty nitty details here. And hopefully that allows us to uh, connect some dots, which uh, may be well, a little bit more difficult to see. Let's see. So uh, after that, we are going to switch over to uh, the electron gas, but I wanted just to motivate the introduction of the electron gas. And uh, we are going to set up the basic equations, but then we will solve these equations next week. And also next Friday, we are just going to work on the uh, midterm. So that will be the last session for that. So we won't have a lecture next Friday. There's only work on the midterm, if that's okay with everybody. So we don't, I don't like to bring in lots of new con concepts. 
uh, while people are stressing with uh, with a midterm because it goes in here and it goes out. <laughs> okay. So uh, Thales theorem uh, is a way for us to uh, try to express what these later determinants mean in second quantization. And hopefully that can give us a deeper understanding of how we interpret these type of transformations. So uh, what we did was to say that the phi zero, we replaced that one with uh, just this C. So this is the phi zero with Hartree Fock. But it could be phi zero for any state. It doesn't need to be a Hartree Fock state. But in our case, we replaced it with the, uh, just this label C. And that could be written out like an I equal one up to N. And then we have this uh, product of uh, creation operators. Now, what Thales theorem says is that there is a general Slater determinant. So a general Slater determinant can be written out in terms of an exponential. And then I have a sum over one particle, one whole excitations. multiplied with the state C. Now, this is something which we can uh, simplify. And I just wanted to bring in also some of the uh, equations we had when we did hartree fock theory. So just a quick reminder. From hartree fock and variational calculus. One of the assumptions we made is that the state we are looking at could be changed into a new state like this, plus some delta phi. Now, if this delta phi contained the same single particle uh, states as in phi, then clearly that would just be a reshuffling of the original one, and we wouldn't bring in anything new. So the whole thing now is that this delta phi contains something which is different from what you have here, okay? So, but we couldn't, in the general uh, formalism we did in first quantization, it was difficult to say what are these things which are different, okay? So what we did, so we did the calculations in what we normally label as a first quantization. And the only thing we are, uh, said then is that the states in this delta phi have to be different from those in uh, in phi, because else we are just multiplying with a constant, a state which is already there. Okay, so we assumed also that, so this state here, something we would label as a phi prime, and we assumed in first quantization that these are not zero. And you can see that when it comes to phi, because phi is already included, and the overlap phi with itself is different from zero. <coughs> In second quantization, what we assume then is that the state C goes over to a state C prime, which was given by the original C plus some delta C. And we simply postulated that this is given by the original C plus a sum over particle whole excitations. And we had this small variation of I, A, and then A, I, A, I of C. So when we derived the hartree fock equations last week in second quantization, I simply stated, let us assume that this guy here, this one, can be written out like this in second quantization. But I didn't tell you why we can do that. I simply argue that uh, let's now assume that this is a type of uh, corrections which we get. Now, Thole's theorem actually tells us that the general Slater determinant can be written like this. So I want to give you the kind of background and motivation and theoretical foundation for why we did what we did. So there is a difference when you do second quantization and first quantization is that in first quantization, 
since you're looking at just these linear combinations, it can be difficult to ascribe this to a specific physical interpretation. When you go to second quantization, on the other hand, uh, we are now going to say that we modify the Slater determinant by a linear combination of one particle, one whole excitations. And these excitations or these combinations are given by a small parameter, which means that when we used variational calculus, what we had is that this delta C, so this follows this condition here, followed from variational calculus. So when we had this change, which we left unspecified, then variational calculus simply told us that this has to be fulfilled. And when we use second quantization, what we found then, so this is a kind of repeat and putting things in a more kind of a overarching, with an overarching view, what we found then was that these specific matrix elements had to be equal to zero. And these are given, uh, so they are given by, and I'm just repeating this one for the sake of completeness, plus this sum over J, and then I have an AJ, VIJ, anti-symmetrized. And these matrix elements have to be zero. And one possible way to fulfill that is to define a, a new Hamiltonian, a one-body Hamiltonian, which we diagonalize and produces this A and I's as a new orthogon orthogonal basis. That was one way to fulfill this condition. But that's one of many. You can actually neglect all the states about the Fermi level, just put that one to zero. So that means another possibility could just be to put A of F of A equal to zero and simply have I of F of I equal to some epsilon i Hartree-Fock. That's also another option for doing Hartree-Fock theory. That would create a kind of artificial gap around the Fermi level, because these states, i, a here, they would just be given by the one body potential which you had before you added this term. So what we did was simply to require, uh, so this is one possible choice, Another possible choice which fulfills the first equation was the one which we have used now, which gives an epsilon A of F and then an I of F of I equal to epsilon I of F. And then the basis which we produce then, the new basis is actually an orthonormal basis. So these are just different ways of doing the Hartree-Fock calculation. So when we are going to encounter the electron gas, that was the way it was done originally. And that created an artificial gap around the Fermi level. So when you calculate the derivatives for quantities like effective masses, which we will look at later, then these would have a discontinuity around the Fermi level, which would then be artificial. So there are many ways of solving these equations. And uh, what you see as the second one is often called the standard Hartree-Fock. Some people call it the canonical Hartree-Fock, but there is kind of no, how to say, uh, what is a preferred way, uh, except that this is the last one is the one which most people use. Now let's take a look at the uh, uh, Fowler's theorem. So we stated now that we can write a general Slater determinant like that. So let's prove that, that this is the case. So if you now, we need some kind of uh, uh, intermediate steps. So I just wanted to show you the result we are going to get. So I can actually write out this Slater determinant as a product over the whole states. And then I can tailor expand the exponential. So one plus, and then I have a sum over A which is larger than the Fermi level. So I goes for up to states, all states up to the Fermi level. And then I have my C, I, A, A, I. And then I have the square term. So I'm just Taylor expanding. So I have my A larger than F, C, I, A of A, I dagger, A, I. And this is squared. And this goes all the way up to infinity. 
And this is then multiplied with this state. So we can actually write it like that. So let's uh, try to understand how we can write it like that. So let's, uh, let's assume now that I has only two contributions. So we started with a state. Uh, so let me just exemplify and, and try to tell you what is happening here. So if you now look at the, uh, uh, the case with only two whole states, what we have originally is actually an exponential of AI with a sum over CIA of AI. So that's the original expression we have now. So let's say, assume now that I is just equal to one and two. And let us write it out. So when you write it out now, what you would get, so you have only two states up to the Fermi level. So this sum is, is finite, whereas the sum over A is in principle infinite. So C then would be given by the exponential. And then I would have a term which uh, runs over A, and then I have C1A, AA1 times A1. And then I have plus, and then I have a new sum over A, but now I have two here. And then I have AA and A2 acting on this reference state. That sound okay? So I just want to give an example here because then you see immediately what is going on. This means that I can actually rewrite this as A and B. So what I have then is an exponential of A plus B. Now, some of you may have encountered this theorem. It's called the baker campbell hausdorff expansion. Now, the thing which is beneficial for us is that A and B actually commute. And I'm going to show you that. So that's very important. If these operators commute, if that is the case, then I can write this as E of A times E of B. If they commute, only if they commute. So let's see that they commute first, right? So let me try to convince you that this is the case. So let's just take a, a general operator. So what we have to show is that if I have AI, A, A, A and AI, sorry, and A, B, so these are two general operators of that type. So let's just see that these two guys commute actually. So what you have then, when you write it out, is just an A, 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 I, A, B, A, J, minus, and then we have A, B, A, J, A, A, and A, I. Now we just keep this one, and now we know that the J is a whole state, and A is a particle state. So when we contract them, they have to give zero, right? The, the Kronecker delta has to be zero because they are by definition I's and the J's are whole states. So they are different from B and A. So that means I can rewrite this one and then I can have, this is a plus and I have A, B, A, A and A, J, A, I. And you see the trick which I'm gonna do now, I'm just simply going to interchange creation and annihilation operators. So I can rewrite this one. So this is equal, equal, and this becomes equal to A, 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 B. And then I have my A, J, A, I. And now I can interchange A, J, and A, I. So it's the same here. And then I have plus A, 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 B, A, I, A, J. And that is again, and now I interchange A, B, and A, I. So this is the same as minus A, A, a i a b a j and that is equal to zero because then they have the same term so these guys do commute now if we go back to what we have here you see now that what i have is a product of two exponentials and i have that for particle for one so i can put a label one here and two here one and two 
And you see now that if I have more, if I have three, four, five, and so on, I will just have A plus B plus C plus D, et cetera, et cetera. So that means that I can rewrite that expression, which you see here, the one here, the slate to determinant, I can actually rewrite it like this because then I have the product here, okay? So that's simply because these guys commute and then this expression here applies. <coughs> that was part one. So if we then move on, if we look at this uh, exponential, which we have this product states, so we have C prime, which is equal to this uh, product of uh, all these guys here. So I equal one up to the Fermi level, the number of particles we can fill in. And then we are getting now terms one plus, and then I have a term A, and then I have my CIA, a, 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 I. And now I'm having the second term, which contains a sum over A and B. But now this contains also I, because it's the same I which I've singled out. Remember now it's the same I here. So this is gonna have an A, 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 I, A, B, A, I here because I just square it, but keep in mind now that I wrote out, I single out everything which has to do with I here. So what I'm getting then is actually terms which now contain AI to the power of N. Now AI, if I destroy it once, I can't destroy it again because it's gone. So if I have n larger than one, then these terms have to be zero. So that means that I can rewrite this as a product of i equal one up to n, and then I have one plus this term a, and then I have my c i a, a a, and a i acting on that reference state, which we have chosen. So if you now look at this one, uh, what you have is something uh, like this. So if, you, if we now look carefully at it, what we would have is a uh, product of these guys i of n of one plus a of c i a, And now I'm writing out the determinant which we had here with the original creation and annihilation operators. So these are given states, and then we have the vacuum state here. So I can now rewrite these ones uh, in terms. If you look at uh, these guys, this is a product which is now acting on all these states. So I can rewrite this product in terms of I have one plus A, and then I have C, and the first one now is going to be equal to C I one of A, of A I, and then I have A I one multiplied with A I one, and then I have the, so this is one, and let me just put it like this, and this gets multiplied with one plus, a of C I two of A, A I, A I two. And then I have A I two here. And this goes all the way to the last one. One plus A of C I N of A of A I, A I N multiplied with A I N here like this. And finally, acting against zero. So the only thing I did now was actually to uh, write out this product. And this product now contains these states I1, I2, etc. And I simply just reshuffle the operator so that they act, uh, can perform the contractions on the right elements. Okay. <clears throat> now, you see now that in this specific case, 
when I have a term like this one, this will now create a state in I2 and this will destroy it. And it leaves only this one. Oh, by the way, no, I did something wrong here. I actually should have, so this should be that one, like this. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot this parenthesis. So that means that you're left with a term here. So with a, a term AI here, which accompanies that one. And that means that you can rewrite everything as a uh, sum of I, and then I have my AI plus this term over A of CIA acting on the vacuum state. Now, if you then look at this, we, we, what we could say now is that this is defines a new creation operator. So we could write this as an I over B I plus acting on that one. And that looks like the Slater determinant we defined earlier. But there is a problem here. It is not general enough. It is not general enough because the sum A runs over all the states above the Fermi level. Whereas in the previous case, we had no constraint on this operator here. So this one is actually an operator with a constraint. So it is not general enough for us to claim that this is a general representation of a Slater determinant because we have a specific constraint here. So this leads to a constraint. with some A, which is larger than the Fermi level. So can we actually uh, get around this and actually show that this represents, after all, a general Slater determinant? So let's uh, try to take a look at that. And there are some small man mathematical manipulations which uh, uh, are interesting for us. But in general, now what we have is that the Slater determinant can be written in this way, as we showed, but we don't know whether this new operator here is a general operator. So keep in mind also that when you are making a transformation from one basis to another one, the original basis had this operator, and we performed a unitary transformation of the single particle states. So we can rewrite the single particle states in second quantization, which means that that unitary transformation applies to the operator A. So that's another way to reading it. So just keep in mind that the states I, which we have defined, or just a general state P, is actually given by an AP dagger acting on the vacuum state. So when we perform a transformation from one basis to the other one, we are then, in this second quantization picture, we're actually performing a unitary transformation on the creation and annihilation operators. Now, when we started with this basis, the original basis, there were no restrictions on these. Here, we have a small restriction because the sum is now limited to some terms. So we want to see whether this is, after all, a general representation of a Slater determinant. So just keep in mind that when we did this unitary transformation, we had a state lambda, which could be written out in terms of uh, a sum over the state, uh, let's call them P here. We have an overlap coefficient like this. Now, if these states P are now given by the second quantization formalism, it means that what we are transforming then is actually the creation and annihilation operators by a unitary transformation. So that's another way to read what we are doing now. But let's take a look at uh, this specific thing here. And there are some kind of mathematical technicalities which are actually worth looking at. So what we are going to assume now is that there is, uh, that, we, that we can construct. So the question we want to pose now is, can we construct a general Slater determinant 
which I'm going to call for C tilde, which is now given by these new operators. So what we uh, are going to say now is that uh, these operators, this, uh, and let's call this bi tilde. So what we're going to say now, so these are not necessarily the same, not necessarily. Necessarily that bi tilde is equal to bi, the one which we had in the previous slide. So now we are simply assuming that there is a general Slater determinant which is constructed from these operators, where these operators B i tilde are given by a unitary transformation. So that means that we have a unitary transformation from this basis P. There is a, an overlap, we just label this as an F, multiplied with A P. So this is the way you would write the transformed state in second quantization, because you're acting on the annihilation and creation operators. So the unitary coefficients, this FIP of a unitary matrix, they apply now to the creation and annihilation operators. And this is actually pretty useful to think of because you will see this being applied in many, many applications of second quantization. You're transformed from one basis to the other one, and that means a change of your creation and annihilation operators. So it takes some time to digest these things, but I hope by going through this that you can connect the dots here. So we have this uh, uh, new Slater determinant. And what we want to show is that the C tilde is the same as this C prime, which we set up. And uh, we also assume that this C, the original one, and the overlap with this C tilde is different from zero. That's a basic assumption we are making here. So if we now look at this overlap, let's take a closer look here. The overlap is going to look like zero, and then I have A, and I'm gonna call this for I, a state I, since it's a whole state, but it refers to the state I n. Then I have an I n minus one, and this goes all the way to I n two, I I two and I, I1, but then I'm multiplying this with these uh, unitary transformed operators. So what I would have then is a sum of a, a sum of a P, which now runs from I1 up to IN. And I have my F of uh, I1, this is the first one, multiplied and P, multiplied with AP dagger. So I'm just putting in this transformation. And then I have my sum over Q equal I1 up to IN. And then I have my F of I2 now of Q of AQ dagger. So I'm simply plugging in that specific transformation for each of the new operators. Because the Slater determinant C tilde is defined in terms of this B tilde. And that means that I have to insert these quantities here for every B1, B2, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final one would just be a sum. I'm just putting a label T of I1 up to I end. And then I have an F of I end. I'm picking up that specific state of uh, T and this has an AT dagger, and these act on the vacuum state zero here. So this is actually zero. So now I'm just writing this out. Now in order for this to be, uh, and we're also going to use what's called intermediate normalization. So if we do that, where we state that this is equal to one, then, what this product is, what you have here, is just a determinant. And that determinant is equal to one. Now, this is not easy to see. So let's uh, show that what you have here is actually a determinant. So let's do that. And a way to see that is just to take two particles. 
So if we take two particles, so let's do that. So what we are going to get is that due to this condition, what we end up with is, is that the determinant of this fi of p, which I just write like this, has to be equal to one. So let's see that. So let's take two particles only, because then you will see that immediately, that this has to be a determinant. So if we take two particles, then what we have is zero, and then we have A2 and A1. And then we have the first transformation, which then has to be F11 times A1 dagger. This is a transformed state plus F12 with A2 dagger. Okay, that's the first one. And this is multiplied with F21 of A1 dagger plus F22 with A2 dagger. So this one is our state B1 dagger, and this is our B2 dagger acting on the vacuum. Now, if you multiply this out now, what you get is zero, A2, A1, and then I have F1, A1 dagger multiplied with F21, A1 dagger, and this has an obvious answer when we perform the contractions, right? This has to give zero because I cannot create A1 and then create A1 again. So this is going to give us zero, that specific term. Does that make sense? So when I take the contractions now, you see that I have, I'm trying to create A1 twice. And since these are fermions, I cannot do that. But let's just leave it as it stands. So I have plus. And then I have F1, A1 dagger with F22, A2 dagger. I get plus, and then I have F12, A22, and then I have F21 of A1 dagger, and plus F12 multiplied with F22, and then I have A2 dagger, A2 dagger, and this is just multiplied with a vacuum state here. So if you look at the uh, contractions you do now, you see that this obviously has to be zero. And the same applies to that. And then what we are left with, when I now perform the contractions, you see also that in this specific case here, I need to interchange A1 and A2. So what I get then is that this is equal to F11 times F22 minus F12, F21. And what is that? That's the determinant. Would you agree on that? So what we have, and in many textbooks, actually in Thule's original article, it says we see easily that this is a determinant. This is the kind of statements which are always provoking. But it's often easy if you just break it down like this, and then you see that this is determinant. So what we are saying now, if we have assumed this, then that product chain has to translate into a determinant, which is one. And this is also a definition of a unitary transformation. It has a determinant, which is one. So what we have then is a set of unitary transformation. And we assume then that this, since this is a unitary transformation or an orthogonal transformation, it has an inverse. So let's just set that up and then we are going to uh, conclude the, the proof and then we take a, a little bit longer break. I just need five more minutes but just to conclude the proof here. So what we have, we have assumed that if F, this matrix F has an inverse, so we have assumed that this is a unitary or orthogonal matrix. So we're assuming unitarity, orthogonality. That means that we have some relations which have to be fulfilled. So we have Fik multiplied with Kj the multiplied with the inverse matrix element, that has to be equal to delta ij. So these are just relations which follow from these assumptions. 
and then I have an IJ inverse multiplied with a JK, and this has also to be equal to delta IK. So these are some conditions which follow from the inverse and the unitarity. So what I can do then is actually, if I look at now a sum over I, and I have my F K I and the inverse here multiplied with this B I operator, then I can rewrite this one as a sum over I of F K I minus one. And then I have a sum over P, which now runs from the first one and in principle to infinity. But the matrix F is a finite matrix. And it looks like this. Now, if I then look at the uh, uh, conditions which follow from a unitary transformation, you see now that I can actually rewrite this as an AK dagger plus a sum over I. And then I have a sum over P, which now runs from N plus one and in principle to infinity. And then I have an FKI minus one and then an FIP multiplied with AP dagger. And if I define a new constant, a new coefficient CKP, which is given by the sum over I, less than the Fermi level, which applies to this one here. And if I define that to be FKI inverse, multiplied with FIP, like that, then I can rewrite this expression. If I do that, then this can be rewritten as, so we can redefine. So this A K plus this sum of I, and then I have a sum of a P, which now goes from N plus one above the Fermi level to infinity. And then I have this F K I inverse F I P of A P dagger. I can rewrite that one as A K and actually started with something which was general, but I can actually rewrite it like this, where this is now the sum of a states above the Fermi level of a C K P. So there exists a, such an object C K P times A P dagger. And this is the same as what we had before of a k plus a sum. So k is a whole state. And then we had a sum over a, and then we had the c i a, which we wrote. So we should put a tilde here. And then we had the a a. And this is the same as this operator, which we defined as a b of k dagger. So we actually showed starting with a general transformation. Uh, we have simply showed now that this slater determinant C tilde, which we wrote as a product over this B I tilde dagger acting on zero, is equivalent with the one which we found from Thule's theorem, this B I acting on zero. So in summary, uh, what we have then is an interpretation of what we see in first quantization in terms of particle hole excitations. So when we had in first quantization, and let's just summarize this. Then in first quantization, what we had is a Slater determinant by zero Hartree-Fock, which was given by the determinant of uh, these coefficients C multiplied with the determinant from the ansatz which we had before we did the hartree fock calculation. So this is the way it looks like in first quantization. When you look at this expression here, you're simply assuming that your state is a Slater determinant. None of these are eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian. But it's difficult to extract a kind of physical interpretation from these coefficients C. When you go to second quantization, what we can do then 
is that we can express a general Slater determinant. So this phi zero hot refock is just a general Slater determinant. We can actually express a new one, which is simply given in terms of uh, this exponential. And where we sum over all the possible particle hole excitations, AI. And that gives us a way to physically uh, interpret what this transformation means at the level where we transform and vary the single particle basis. And when we then uh, calculated the variation in these states using variational calculus, then this led to a very simple set of equations, which we got immediately, which went like this. And when we translate this into a full configuration interaction picture, it means that hartree fock theory is a way to transform because these states which we had, they correspond to this overlap here between the ground state and the one particle, one hole excitation. So we are, have found a general unitary transformation which zeroes out particular matrix elements. So I hope this kind of uh, tour de force here uh, with Fowler's theorem uh, gives you a kind of, uh, how to say, a better understanding of uh, what these excitations mean and what these uh, variational changes actually mean. Because this is a kind of picture which I think at least makes it easier to understand in terms of uh, simpler physical arguments, what is taking place in the system. So it means that you're making a new basis, which contains a linear combination of all possible one particle, one whole states, plus the original state you started with. And that's something which is not so easy to read off from this term here. And in many body physics, you will encounter this kind of jargon or in terms of particle whole excitations continuously. That is a kind of established language and a way to interpret physical processes. So instead of you thinking of letting the interaction act infinitely many times, you're rephrasing your physics understanding in terms of an infinity of particle hole excitations. And Thole's theorem actually gives you, I would say, I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's why I liked it so much when I saw it the first time, it gives me a, a very nice way to interpret what happens here in terms of one particle, one whole excitations. And these two guys represent the same thing. Because this C which you have here could be that one. I went a little bit over time, but I... Uh, 10 minutes, I'm sorry for that, but I just wanted to conclude this piece uh, because hopefully it allows you to, to make your own connections and uh, hopefully give a little better insight about what goes on.